Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience and holding. We now have your presenters in conference. Please be aware, each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. You may submit your questions or comments electronically at any time using the chat window located to the right side of the slideshow presentation. Underneath the slides, you'll also see a window labeled files where you may download a PDF copy of today's presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's first presenter, Ms. Nancy Myers. Please go ahead, ma'am. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nancy Myers, and I'm the Vice President of Leadership and System Innovation at the AHA. Welcome to this webinar on antimicrobial stewardship and HAI prevention, insights from COVID-19. This is brought to you by our AHA team training and our great partners at BD. I'll be serving as your MC, but before I introduce and, and turn the, the gavel over to our speakers, just want to remind you of a couple of things. Um, audio for the webinar can be accessed either by dialing in on your phone or through your computer speakers. We are recording this webinar and it will be made available to all registrants and you'll be notified via email when it is available. Finally, we'll hold a panel discussion and then a Q&A session at the end. So if you have questions that come up, please put them in the chat. And I see that you're already talking to each other in the chat, which is great. So feel free to give each other tips or share your experiences with each other in the chat as well as we go through today's session. So to start us off, I'd like to introduce Calvin Yu, who's the Medical Director of Medical Informatics at BD, to kick us off. Calvin? Thank you, Nancy. This is the first session in a half-day BD event titled Infection Prevention and Pharmacy, the Road to Integrated Stewardship During a Pandemic. We'd also like to invite you to join us for the remaining sessions in today's series. Please visit bd.com forward slash altogether now or visit the link below to register for the remaining sessions, kicking off in about an hour. For this particular webinar, entitled Antimicrobial Stewardship and HAI Prevention Insights from COVID-19, our collective experience in healthcare regarding this pandemic has highlighted the efforts of physicians, nurses, and pharmacists, while also delineating certain pain points that already exist in healthcare during surge capacity times. Today's program objectives are, Number one, to review hospital-acquired infection and co-infection trends in COVID. Two, what are potential metrics of success for stewardship and infection prevention programs uh, in a surge capacity situation? Three, how to leverage antimicrobial stewardship and infection prevention programs to address patient care gaps. Four, protecting both patients and healthcare workers via resource optimization optimization insights from a stewardship perspective, and finally, how does COVID-19 inform future surge capacity planning, particularly during cold and flu season? Our panelists today are Eddie Stenham and Rebecca Mooring. Dr. Stenham is an Associate Professor of Research at Intermountain Healthcare and Medical Director of Antimicrobial Stewardship, overseeing programs across 23 hospitals and over 200 outpatient clinics throughout Utah, Nevada, and Idaho. He's trained at the University of Colorado in Emory, and he also founded Intermountain's Infectious Diseases Telehealth Program with research topics including improving infrastructure to augment antimicrobial prescribing practices. Eddie served on national committees and has represented Intermountain at the United Nations, the CDC, and the White House. Dr. Mooring is an infectious diseases physician, epidemiologist, and associate professor working in the Duke Center for Antimicrobial Stewardship and Infection Control. She is Medical Director of Duke's Antimicrobial Stewardship Team and serves as the Co-Director for Research at the Duke Antimicrobial Stewardship Outreach Network, consisting of over 25 community hospitals. She trained at Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine and the University of North Carolina. Her research interests include development of metrics, metrics to guide decisions about antimicrobial stewardship programs, design, and strategy. Today's session will occur in three sections. First, a brief 15-minute summary of clinical findings from relevant medical literature and research conferences on hospital-acquired infections and COVID. Second, a 30-minute roundtable discussion on antimicrobial stewardship and infection prevention issues during the COVID pandemic. And finally, a question and answer period from the audience. Now, throughout this pandemic, with over 90 million worldwide cases, more than 500,000 deaths in the U.S. at this point, Co-infection with drug-resistant pathogens in COVID patients 
has been reported in medical literature and even in the regular lay press. The screenshot here on the right is just one example, a recent example last month, of a particularly deadly and resistant fungal outbreak from Canada auris that is also known for its extremely high mortality rate. And then this is just one example of several additional issues surrounding COVID patients and other types of infections that may affect overall readmission or mortality. Speaking of which, data present, uh, presented at national conferences and forums have shown that COVID patients, compared to their closest clinical counterparts, namely those tested for SARS-CoV-2 but negative, and COVID patients have a higher mortality rate, both in ICU and non-ICU settings, a longer length of stay, and a higher percentage needing ICU care. Now, sensibly, one could say that these clinical differences uh, might reflect just different testing patterns. However, in a different analysis of the same data set, which consisted more of more than 1.8 million SARS-CoV-2 tested patients, we see here that COVID-positive patients were cultured at a 97% rate, with a very close 92% rate for those who ended up COVID negative. Now, as context, patients who were never tested for COVID were cultured at only about 40% uh, rate for comparison. And so this makes clinical sense as those suspected of COVID can have similar presentation to, say, bacterial pneumonia or even neurosepsis. And so getting cultures to find out the infection cause or causes makes sense and perhaps explains why more than 90% of COVID suspects are getting other respiratory blood or urine cultures performed. Reported at the European COVID conference recently, the potential for having another infection in COVID patients is also higher if you just look at the individual culture source uh, positive results. So as an example, we see here that 24% of respiratory cultures in COVID patients being positive <coughs> for non-COVID pathogens. <clears throat> this is compared to 14 to 15% for COVID negative patients and those patients who were never tested for COVID. Some other highlights include uh, more Canada and Pseudomonas culture positives in COVID patients versus COVID negative patients, co-infection with another respiratory virus, relatively low but still possible at 2.2%. And finally, more cultures were performed later in the hospitalization in COVID patients, perhaps reflecting an added complexity to the clinical care compared to those that did not have COVID. So a lot of these studies were lab-based delineations of possible co-infection, but how might this play out in real life? A study out of Johns Hopkins, which involved not just lab results, but an assessment using chart review by uh, clinical physicians, looked at early hospitalization culture results in COVID cases. Now note, unlike the other studies, this study just looked at the first seven days of hospitalization and focused on uh, catching bacterial co-infection acquired in the community and not so much hospital-acquired infections. Now, they found that bacterial community-acquired pneumonia co-infection with COVID was relatively rare at 1.2%. However, patients presenting as such were given antibiotics 69% of the time. That's a 1.2% versus 69% differential. They highlight Hopkins, this, this discrepancy is a call to arms for stewardship teams during the pandemic because, as you know, antibacterials do not treat viral infections. Now hold that 69% antibiotic statistic use from Hopkins in your head because that is virtually the same number that we see in this larger study referenced in this poster but accepted for publication and what should be online for everyone in about a month. And this one shows that 68% uh, antibiotic use rate in COVID patients uh, was apparent compared to 46% in COVID negative. And this is despite the fact that only 20% in both cohorts, in both groups, had a bacterial or fungal culture positive. And the antibiotics being used, aside from that differential of 20% versus 68% or 20% versus even 46% in those that were COVID negative, the antibiotics being used are also interesting. Third, fourth generation cephalosporins, quinolones, beta-lactam combinations, carbapenems. These are all drug-resistant uh, 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 agents that have resistance issues uh, way before the pandemic. And so the question arises then, what will be the effect on drug resistance overall if we are overusing, if you will, these drugs during a year-long plus uh, pandemic? 
And particularly now that scientists feel like there's a possibility that COVID comes back in a seasonal yearly fashion, what does this do to uh, our arsenal of antimicrobial medications? Clearly, there is an antimicrobial stewardship opportunity here. Now, a few studies have looked at the pediatric population, but this one did, and looked at positive blood and respiratory cultures in COVID patients, again, showing the potential for co-infection, that it does exist, and with bacteria that already have resistance issues. Listed here in their list are Staph aureus, which has the M famous MRSA resistance strain, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which has multi-drug resistance strains at many hospitals across the country, and E. coli and Klebsiella, both of which have carbapenem resistance strains, or the so-called untreatable, quote-unquote, superbugs, as the lay press call them. And for those hospital administrators out there, one study in Annals of Internal Medicine looked at hospital outcomes in COVID patients that were discharged. And out of 1,250 patients discharged to home, and a smaller subset to a skilled nursing facility, 84 of those patients died by 60 days post-discharge. Another 189, or 15% of the original cohort, were readmitted also within 60 days. And this is not an uncommon phenomenon for ID physicians out there. Uh, case in point, the CDC threats report in 2019 likewise showed a higher morbidity and a higher mortality in patients who have certain multi-drug resistance infections. But for a new the respiratory virus that we know little about, these statistics are similarly very sobering. In summary, the medical data thus far in the pandemic shows a small percentage of COVID patients having a bacterial or fungal co-infection risk, ranging as high as 20%, but as low as 2% during the first seven days of hospitalization. Together, they might imply that perhaps co-infection risk increases with longer hospital stays. Regardless, antibiotic use in, in these studies show uh, it to be high at nearly 70% of COVID patients uh, who we know have a longer length of stay, uh, higher mortality, and higher readmission rates. The question is, now that we have these data insights, what can be done further upstream to help mitigate some of these statistics? The path of least resistance would be to use pre-existing infrastructures to help, such as antimicrobial stewardship teams, whose goal is to facilitate appropriate and timely antimicrobial use and or infection prevention programs whose charge it is to prevent infection spread and monitor hospital-associated infections. The stewardship and infection prevention programs also make sense from a regulatory standpoint. As the hospital administrators out there are aware, the Joint Commission has long supported, reviewed, and dissected your infection prevention programs in, in their licensing audit surveys. And in 2016, they started looking to see if you had an antimicrobial stewardship program. The new development is that CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, in March of 2020 codified that having an antimicrobial stewardship program with very specific elements and functions was necessary as a condition of participation, that is, to receive money from Medicare and Medicaid programs. They are also tethered together administratively stewardship programs, uh, to stewardship programs with the already well-established infection prevention programs in that same ruling. So we do indeed have some clinical and regulatory-based logic to involve stewardship and infection prevention teams to help mitigate COVID outcomes. Here to unpack some of that opportunity are two special guests in a roundtable discussion format. Eddie and Rebecca, first up, how has your uh, antimicrobial stewardship program been engaged in the pandemic response? And so, um, Eddie, maybe I'll open it up to you since you work in a multi-hospital system first. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, happy to address that, and thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so Intermountain Healthcare is 23 hospitals, 200-plus outpatient clinics, and we have really a centralized antimicrobial stewardship program that is integrated into the healthcare network. We have traditional antibiotic stewardship programs set at our large facilities. Um, those traditional kind of inpatient-based antimicrobial stewardship programs and then we have our tele antimicrobial stewardship program, which is run centrally by a team that covers um, our 17 small community hospitals um, that are set across the state and into Idaho. And so from the beginning of the pandemic, um, the whole antimicrobial stewardship infrastructure, along with our uh, infectious disease colleagues, um, have really been 
uh, fully integrated into managing the COVID pandemic on both an inpatient and outpatient standpoint. Um, initially, we were engaged with um, identifying patients, logging therapeutics, making sure we had adequate track of who's in the hospital and who didn't. We then obviously evolved into um, more standardized processes as our numbers went up. Um, our stewardship team has managed all the uh, emergency use authorization of the new drugs, including remdesivir, um, and then has really taken on a role of stewarding those drugs in addition. And then our teams have been integral into uh, what we're calling, you know, remote COVID rounds, where we round with the clinical teams um, every day on their COVID patients, really quick, high-level rounds to ensure that all of those COVID patients are on the appropriate um, therapeutics uh, to treat um, SARS-CoV-2. That, however, is a, a time also that we use to really steward the patients in terms of whether or not they need systemic antimicrobials as well. Um, and now we're moving into this frontier of stewarding monoclonal antibody therapies um, for uh, the prevention of severe disease. And so really an active and dynamic area um, of integration in both the inpatient and outpatient side. Back to you, Bill. Yeah, you know, th that's interesting because uh, the, the two, the remdesivir and the monoclonal antibodies, I would imagine through the stewardship team, you could also help the pharmacy in sort of uh, uh, making sure there's a, a stockpile predicated on the number of patients that you have, maybe your past experience and what you anticipate in the future, just looking at the local Utah numbers. Is, do, you, do you foresee that as something ongoing that, that stewardship teams can provide to the, the pharmacy counterparts? Yeah, absolutely. Our stewardship team of pharmacists, we have approximately um, 12 antimicrobial stewardship pharmacists across the system. Um, we're really the, the content experts for these drugs and we're the go-to people for you know, the, the use of these drugs and have developed a number of uh, tools for the frontline pharmacy staff. But importantly, um, as remdesivir rolled out and the supply was really limited, um, it was our team that really stewarded that drug, and they had to receive approval from us to be able to get remdesivir uh, approved for their patients. Um, now that remdesivir obviously has a little more, um, uh, we have certainly more volume of that, um, that procedure has kind of declined. But now really it's looking at the monoclonal antibodies, and we've worked with the state, our team has worked with the state to really set the parameters of when to use monoclonal antibodies in people that are mildly symptomatic but are at high risk for uh, developing severe disease. And so we have created a model-based approach that each individual gets a specific score based on comorbidities, and then we adjust that score up and down based on the availability that we have of the monoclonal antibody as allocated by the state. And so um, we're going to continue to be part of that process in terms of evaluating supply and demand and um, who we can provide that drug to. Yeah, that, that is fantastic to hear because, uh, as both of you know, stewardship programs were initially seen as police forces, but now you're truly integrated and, and helping not just the pharmacy and, in, in, um, you know, par levels and stockpiling, but also the, the clinical aspect, I think, is much appreciated. Rebecca, you're from a uh, well-respected um, academic center. I wonder if you can give some high-level insights on how your stewardship teams have been engaged. Thanks, Calvin, um, and thanks for having me on to talk about this topic. Um, yeah, so, I mean, COVID has just really impacted a lot of our daily work, and I would echo a lot of what um, Eddie discussed. But I think, you know, the main role that as a steward um, we've had to step into during the pandemic is really just being that clinical champion and that expert to know about um, just the immense amount of information coming out um, for COVID. So I, I think you guys probably have seen, but um, 
the NIH has a completely different website that just looks at COVID literature, and it um, basically shows that every week there's over 2,000 publications just dealing with COVID. And so if you are a bedside clinician trying to synthesize all of the information that's coming at you about an emerging pathogen is really difficult. So the stewardship team, you know, at Duke and also in um, our consulting role with our um, community hospital partners, um, synthesizing that information and making it into something that is actionable is, is a major role that we play um, and just drinking from the fire hose of literature. Um, and it's not only about publications, that 2000 per week is only kind of like the official publications, but it's like FDA announcements, um, it's preprints, um, it is press release information, um, so it's even more than just, you know, the officially published information and just keeping up with that itself has been a major part of our work um, and making that um, fit uh, the clinical practice at our institution um, and taking in all of the factors of supply, cost, working with the state and communicating all of the changes with our clinical staff. Uh, and that's just taken all of that kind of policy and communication work has taken a, a, a big um, part of our time because of the constant assessing and reassessing of that emerging data um, and updating our guidelines. I laugh because, um, you know, when uh, COVID first came out, like our first institutional set of guidelines was basically like, okay, we have supportive care. And now our institutional guidelines are just, you know, pages and pages long of potential strategies um, and therapeutics that we could use. And I tried to count up the number of times we've updated our, gui our institutional guidelines. And we actually have three here at Duke, one for peds, one for adults, and then another for immunocompromised adults, um, transplant um, heme malignancy. Um, and it's upwards of 25. So uh, I have to go to pharmacy meetings every Every time I change our institutional guidelines and explain the rationale, um, and I'm really lucky that um, I have great partners and committees to, to work with on that, but just keeping up in itself is, is just a major, major job, um, and helping the clinicians on the front line feel confident that um, the way our institutions are approaching, you know, uh, the clinical management is, is um, based on data. So, so that's been a lot of our work. I think the other thing is just being the um, person that goes between, you know, the emerging data and then where where is the level of evidence to, like, make clinical decisions. Um, and so one of the main kind of successes that I consider, and I know that's one of your questions, like, what's the metric of success, is just being able to say, like, yeah, my institution didn't kind of go off the rails for, you know, uh, agents with low um, level of evidence and use a lot of that in our patients um, before we knew whether it worked or not. Um, and so, you know, one of those kind of metrics of success for our stewardship program is to actually follow the data that's coming out and make the right clinical decisions for our patients. That, that's great that uh, your both your pharmacy colleagues and your hospitalists and intensivists can can rely on uh, e your group interpreting the copious data coming out. I think that's that's a nice new niche for for antimicrobial stewardship. Not new, but maybe even more relevant during this pandemic. There is actually a question. I'll do this top American Top Forty style. Maybe you're all too young to know about that. But Russ Olmsted writes in. Some health, health systems have reported notable increase in CLABC and VAE in patients with COVID. Do the uses of antibiotics track to the most common pathogens that cause these types of HAIs? So I think this speaks to the first bullet point. What, what HAIs and antibiotic use have you seen in your institution? And then also, you know, any comments on CLABC and ventilator-associated uh, pneumonia or events in particular? Eddie, maybe you can go since Rebecca just talked. Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, certainly the challenge that we've had um, in terms of hospital-associated infections comes in the patients that, um, in particular, have long hospital stays. And those patients, when you see these clinically, are a group of patients that are in the intensive care unit many times for weeks. 
many times with this hyperinflammatory syndrome on the ventilator, very high oxygen requirements, intermittent fevers, intermittent worsening, and improvement of oxygen saturation. And it's in those patients that we see these HAIs come up. And one of the challenges that we have is the clinical evaluation of a patient that's been on the ventilator and has waxing and waning ventilatory response and also fever. And so in our institution, what we'll see is people that may have an intermittent decline in clinical status, maybe with high fever, worsening O2 need, and then that will stimulate um, an evaluation for an HAI. And inevitably, what will happen is a tracheal aspirate will be performed on a patient who's been intubated for two and a half weeks, and invariably, that'll turn out positive for any number of pathogens. Um, the patient has an uninterpretable chest x-ray. They have a fever, they have hypoxia, which will then will uh, stimulate antibiotic use and then trigger um, a ventilator-associated event. And in most cases, we think that those are truly... Um, just colonization and what you're dealing with is the actual underlying physiology of uh, severe COVID-19. But it's that evaluation of HAIs that may or may not actually be present but triggers these events, which are often CAUTIs and also VAEs. And helping the teams, and this is something we do on COVID rounds, where we have an infectious disease physician and an infectious disease pharmacist round with each team daily to really help them kind of through the process of like, okay, I do think it's a high enough probability that there could be an HAI. Let's go ahead and culture either through a tracheal aspirate or if O2 SATs can tolerate a bronchial velar lavage and really help the teams kind of walk through when is it appropriate to test for some of these HAIs. And that can be really, really challenging because these patients are so sick. Um, And we've seen, you know, repeated positive cultures, which we think are essentially colonization, but will trigger, um, you know, one of these events. And so that really is a challenge um, in those patients that have those long hospitalizations. We haven't necessarily seen um, increases HAI in the patients that are admitted to the floor and go home in the average three or four day length of stay. It's really that um, critically ill ICU population. Great, and that actually addressed one other question from the audience just now about the difference between ICU and non-ICU length of stay. Um, Now, you mentioned something interesting about, you know, cultures being taken and then from from a clinical physician standpoint, probably a colonizer. I wonder, you know, the, have either of you instituted any diagnostic test policy just for the pandemic? You know, the pandemic is sort of like a super flu season on, you know, augmented, you know, infinite number of times. But it, it could be relevant to diagnostic stewardship, which, which is, you know, a hot thing uh, now that antimicrobial stewardship is codified by the, by, by the CMS and the Joint Commission. So, um You know, maybe, Rebecca, you mentioned um, shoring up guidelines and taking the latest medical literature. How how have you dealt with this issue that Eddie had brought up on, you know, multiple cultures and maybe not clinically relevant? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of things about management of a COVID patient that makes it extremely complex. And, um, you know, one of the main things is just their imaging, their lung imaging is always going to be bad. Um, And so knowing whether that is due to the COVID itself or COVID plus something else um, is sometimes very difficult to clinically differentiate. Um, So in terms of, you know, approaching kind of the workup when someone who hasn't, you know, has an existing COVID infection um, and then going to investigate if they have COVID plus uh, a bacterial infection or, or a new VAP, um, is is difficult. I mean, I think like this is one of the areas that we've been battling for many years <laughs> in our ICUs, and I think many of our stewardship teams have um, you know come up with their own strategies to try and help. Um, I think 
in many situations, especially in the critically ill, um, it's hard. It's very hard to withhold when somebody has a clinical down, downturn. So instead, we work to um, promote the principles of de-escalation. Um, so if someone's empirically started on antibiotics, um, we are following the data that's coming out and their clinical progress to then be able to make decisions day two, day three, to narrow or stop antibiotics if we haven't identified a pathogen or um, if we have identified a pathogen moving to the most targeted therapy. So those principles of antibiotic de-escalation uh, for pulmonary infections in the ICU still, are, um, still apply in COVID. Um, that hasn't changed. Um, but the, just the sheer volume of patients with really severe lung infection in, in our units have. And so I think you see that um, represented, um, and we will see that as we look at, you know, our local HAI and VAP rates, uh, BAE rates. Um, and I think a big part of that is just the uh, severity of illness from COVID, as well as their longer lengths of stay. Obviously, the more days that you're on a ventilator, you're higher risk that you're gonna have for a VAE. In addition to that, um, also now we are treating, you know, the majority of our severely ill, we, well, it's standard of care to give steroids to uh, patients with severe COVID. Um, and so, you know, these are steroid exposed, many times uh, very um, antibiotic exposed, and um, now also uh, using additional Im immune modulating agents. Um, so all of those things are just a very kind of perfect storm scenario for a very high risk population for healthcare associated infection. So, I mean, I think, you know, HAI specifically in COVID patients is one thing, but I think the whole environment of COVID um, and the pandemic itself isn't just about the COVID patients in your hospital. It's also going to affect those patients that don't have COVID in, in your hospital um, indirectly. And, you know, there's lots of reasons for that. I mean, I think the main one is just distraction um, and then your personnel who are, um, just under the stress of the pandemic and focused on getting through their shift um, and may be just distracted from a lot of the practices that they had, um, you know, kind of unlocked before the pandemic to, you know, do appropriate line care, get Foley's out, um, and a lot of that prevention focused work that they had, they're just distracted and burned out from that. So there's all those also like indirect effects um, that could be going on when we look at our HAI rates. So it's important to just, you know, not ignore the other people in your hospital um, as you're taking care of your, you know, complex COVID patients, because there are, you know, our basic, um, you know, infection prevention strategies um, that still work. Um, and we have to make sure that those get delivered appropriately, even in the setting of, the, of a pandemic. Very well put. And I think that's a nice segue to our second main topic, how have infection prevention programs interfaced with stewardships during the pandemic? So, Rebecca, you mentioned, um, you know, to not forget the bundle elements, and I would imagine that would be particularly relevant for Clabsy and Cotty, uh, because as Eddie pointed out, you know, the ICU patients with COVID um, have a particularly complex journey, and a lot of uh, clinicians are proning the patients. And so I would imagine complying with the bundle elements, keeping things clean, it's harder to do when the patients are face down and on their, on their bellies. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit, um, maybe Eddie, since Rebecca just spoke on the, the HAI pre prevention bundles, uh, what you've noticed during, during this pandemic and any improvements that you could uh, foresee. Yeah, I mean, fortunately, and I think Rebecca's in the situation, we, we both came from, you know, pretty strong places of infection prevention and stewardship before the, the pandemic arose. And um, we were in better places because we had a very solid um, infrastructure set up both for infection prevention and stewardship. And so we were coming at this from a place of strength, from a, a culture of safety where we used uh, bundles, we used protocols, we had diagnostic stewardship programs in place, and we were able to fall back on that strength as the pandemic uh, emerged and gained um, certainly traction and increased in cases. 
And so we already had that culture in place. And so we didn't have to, you know, really try to initiate that during the midst of a pandemic. I mean, the infection prevention teams have been working tirelessly across, you know, all of our facilities to keep our caregivers safe um, and keep our patients safe. And so it, it is challenging for them to also make sure to continue to monitor bundle compliance, et cetera. But when that is already embedded in the culture of safety, that has made that easier um, for us uh, across Intermountain Healthcare. Um, and to Rebecca's point is, um, you know, as we've dealt with this now for 12 months, you know, the fatigue has set in um, both from the frontline caregivers but also from infection preventionists and everybody who's involved in HAI prevention. And so it has been a challenge for us. Um, you know, this work continues. And I think at this point, having a collaborative nature with stewardship, with infection prevention is absolutely critical to be able to, to help offset um, some of the work for them um, and really keep a, key, a, a keen eye on some of these HAIs. Very well put. And then, um, you know, some of the studies that uh, we went over earlier um, had a common theme, like even the Hopkins one. Uh, in, in the Hopkins paper, uh, UTIs was the most common other non-respiratory uh, co-infection with, with COVID. And uh, certainly that, that was also presented at, uh, at ID Week and, and the ECMID COVID highlight conferences. And so, so Cadi seems to be a main player. I wonder, uh, Rebecca, do you think, you know, more to your point earlier, do you think this is, you know, uh, a function of Cadi bundles not being adhered to because of surge capacity, which, you know, ostensibly could happen in a very bad flu season too? Um, I know in my former life we had seen rises in Cadi uh, during particularly bad flu seasons. Uh, you know, not due to lack of infection preventionists, but, you know, sheer person power and, um, uh, you know, n nursing the patient ratio issues. And so I wonder if you're seeing the same thing with with COVID because the, their, their care is so complex. They're, they're in isolation, obviously. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, one important thing just to know is that, like, these data are still emerging. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think, you know, I can speak from our experience kind of locally, and, you know, many of you probably have looked at your, your rates uh, locally and kind of um, looked for trends during COVID. Um, but one of the things that we really need is the research to try and bring, like, multi-hospital data together to really look at, at these trends and see if it's something that you wouldn't necessarily recognize if you're looking at a single institution. So there was um, – actually, I think this week the, the Ascension um, – uh, paper came out um, looking at both CLABSI and CAUDI, um, and they did note a change in their CLABSI rates, but their CAUDI rates actually um, seemed pretty similar from uh, pre to post COVID. Um, my personal experience here at um, Duke um, is more focused on the stewardship side. Our, you know, our county rates have been relatively stable through COVID, um, but we have seen a little bit more uh, gram-positive bloodstream infection and positive cultures that we've been um, uh, chasing down um, and trying to understand, you know, where those come from. And so that fits a little bit with the extension uh, paper that just came out as well for, for CLABSI potentially being um, you know, an emerging trend associated with the pandemic. So I, I would say, you know, we there's potentially a lot of uh, reasons why we could see these increases in HAI, and there's probably multiple factors, um, both direct um, as a result of just the complex COVID population, as as well as the indirect effects that destruction um, and um, not kind of keeping our good infection prevention practices going through that, as well as just our personnel shifts um, and the stressful nature of the pandemic. Um, so certainly, I think you know we may see you may. Your device utilization rates um, are higher than before, um, and that's usually something that's that's pretty easy to pull down just with your device days. Um, but um, 
yeah, I think the data is still emerging on whether we see that more nationally. Yeah, I wonder, um, you know, in the spirit of how stewardships can interact with infection prevention, are, are your uh, pharmacists or, or physicians that, that round with the stewardship teams, are they trying to help reinforce, you know, pulling a Foley out after 48 hours if it's safe to do so, things like that to help the nurses and the front lines um, with, with the CAUTI prevention bundle? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My rounds in the CCU at our place are always like, why the Foley? WTF, right? Um, that's, that's an everyday thing. Um, so uh, that's, that's, that's a frequent thing that comes up on stewardship rounds. Um, but I think the, the other way that we're trying to, like, help give our infection prevention colleagues a bit of a break is also to kind of keep going with some of our um, reviews and discussions about quality and safety, um, even when they are pulled into, I don't know, uh, think tank uh, emergency meetings with hospital leadership. We're still able to go to those, like, you know, see this root cause analysis assessments, like, with the frontline teams. And so... Because we are also ID physicians, we can hammer home some of those infection prevention practices and lessons um, kind of on the floor with the frontline staff. So we're able to kind of support our infection prevention teams that way. The other thing is, um, you know, uh, because of just the distraction from COVID um, on our IT team, um, the stewardship team has also sometimes uh, noticed some trends emerging um, before our IP teams do. So I mentioned some of those gram positive infections. So, um, you know, our stewardship team re re like reviews all of the blood culture positive blood culture events um, and reviews each case for um, optimization of antibiotics. But, you know, so we really do have kind of a real time analysis of um, our uh, bloodstream infections. And so, like, we kind of, you know, raised the alarm early on. Like, I think we're seeing more coagulating of staff here, um, and we're able to kind of, like, uh, give our IP group a heads up. So there's there's all kinds of examples of kind of that back and forth where, like, we support each effort um, kind of hand in hand. Excellent. I'm sure Eddie and then, has similar anecdotes. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you, Eddie, what it yeah. what Maybe you can give one, one or two examples. Yeah, I think this is just um, an incredible point to make is that, you know, hospital facilities, regardless of size or network base, really has to have a well-staffed and well-functioning infectious disease team, which includes ID clinicians, infection preventionists, antimicrobial stewardship, employee health. And it's really highlighted the value of having a really integrated team to be able to address these pandemics, to, to Rebecca's point, to be able to, you know, pick up uh, from inf inf infection prevention when they're too swamped for stewardship to be able to highlight some of these kind of early areas that we saw early in the pandemic. And as we go through for ID physicians to be able to rely on their stewards to be able to help manage some of the COVID patients, and so they just can't, you know, see all of those in ID consultation. You know, these groups of people work intimately together and can really, you know, augment each other's uh, workflow. And so I think it just highlights the value that, um, you know, a really integrated infectious disease team um, really brings to an institution and the value that they can add, um, you know, to the patient care. Yeah, I mean, I, I think <clears throat> if we want to take two or three takeaways thus far on today, one of them would definitely be, you know, stewardship has gone a long way starting as a perceived police force for stopping antibiotics. And fast forward to now during a worldwide respiratory pandemic, you're not only helping pharmacy with uh, stockpiling or not stockpiling, as the case may be, um, making sure you have par levels of medications. Uh, pertinent to the patient population you're seeing, but also helping improve patient safety, which speaks to potential readmission, potential mortalities, and, you know, definitely I think the, the, the scope of stewardship is being highlighted during this pandemic. I want to switch to the last thing because I think we had some questions from our AHA uh, registrants on, you know, there was a lot in the, earlier in the pandemic on the lack of PPEs. And um, I wonder what your experience is now that we're in our third wave of COVID 
and and how do you ensure or, or how do you help with the healthcare provider safety? So we talked a lot about patient safety, and we still will after this. But what about the healthcare providers? Any any words of wisdom, Rebecca? I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, I think um, certainly we are just asking a lot of our frontline uh, providers. And so I think there are several ways that we can continue to support them. Um, I think from uh, the stewardship perspective, you know, just having um, a team to kind of help with clinical thinking, especially when you're tired um, and you have a lot of patients to think through, having that stewardship team as your backup to be like, okay, you know, I helped review some of your patients today. Let's kind of talk through the decisions on, you know, uh, your patient in bed 12. Um, and just having an additional mind to kind of think through the clinical scenario when you're so tired um, is one of the ways to, that a stewardship team can really support the front line. Um, in addition to having, you know, other human contact, I think, you know, one of the things that you notice uh, in COVID world as compared to what it was before is just that, you know, our healthcare providers really can't hang out together um, unless they're masked. And so even just having an additional, you know, interaction, be it social, um, you know, supportive interaction um, on the wards and having someone else to kind of connect with, um, that's also just been a really rewarding part of uh, doing stewardship through the pandemic. Great. And then, um, you know, just for time's sake, uh, topic three, how can stewardship programs help during uh, pandemic and surge capacity season? So as we mentioned earlier, there, there's a school of thought that uh, COVID is going to stick around in some form on an annual basis, perhaps like seasonal flu. And so what, what learnings can we pull forth from uh, stewardship programs as they're functioning now in the middle of a novel pandemic? But let's assume that this is applicable to a really bad flu season or what if COVID reoccurs. Any provisional thoughts? Eddie, I'll throw it over to you. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the things that our stewardship teams have done really well, and Rebecca's referring to it, is to really improve what you know, we think about as diagnostic safety and the fact that, you know, our frontline clinicians are getting to be COVID experts. Um, but to the earlier points, you know, we can't expect them to digest this incredible amount of information in, about COVID and COVID therapeutics. And you can then, you know, extrapolate this to influenza or a, you know, pandemic for multidrug resistant bacteria. Where stewardship can really be useful is to, like we said, synthesize that data and say, hey, you know, I think this patient, yes, they should be on remdesivir and steroids, but you know, I think they also may be a tocilizumab candidate, or, you know, I think we should think about MISA in this patient um, to really bring in some of those kind of advanced therapies that may not be hitting the radar of frontline clinicians. In addition, you know, our clinicians, particularly the ones on the COVID wards, are seeing all COVID all the time. And one of the things that we take, you know, pride in is to be able to really you know, augment that differential of just COVID-19. And, you know, one of the, the examples I think of, and there's been you know, now many, is that, you know, our clinicians had a patient that looked like COVID, should have been COVID, was being treated for COVID, but the COVID test was negative. And it was the stewardship team to say, hey, I think we should think about PCP. And sure enough, the patient had new diagnosis of HIV, had a positive PCP, and it was that kind of that backup to take away some of that stress and that thinking to say, hey, yes, I, I think we need to consider COVID, but we need to think about these other things, whether it be PCP or invasive aspergillosis or, you know, any of the other things that could mimic it. And it's that, you know, value that we add to the care of the patient in addition to the de-escalation of antibiotics, the discontinuation of antibiotics, the optimization of therapy, the drug dosing, the discharge recommendations, all of that. It's the value that we add in terms of the diagnostic thinking and the uh, um, augmenting of therapeutics that may not be on the radar of frontline clinicians has really shown value, and that's not going away. And, um, you know, that can be integrated for any kind of 
you know, flu pandemic or seasonal coronavirus or, a, you know, on a, a seasonal basis. And so I think that's a value that we've shown time and time again. And it's being recognized now, um, has been recognized by the frontline clinicians, but also being recognized by our healthcare system leaders and hospital leaders. Very well put. Um, and it, it is worth it to reiterate, you know, just because we're in the middle of a pandemic, your undiagnosed HIV, AIDS, your out-of-control diabetics, they're, they're still out there. They still need care, and we still need to think about right. that. Um, so, so speaking of uh, vulnerable populations, there's a lot in the medical literature on, you know, um, people of certain socioeconomic incomes being disproportionately affected with, with COVID. Um, you know, the, li- the list goes on on, on on who, you know, older, older people, uh, diabetics, speaking of diabetics, uh, obese patients. Um, how has your stewardship team dealt with this? Um, you know, are they triaging certain patients to look at first? Or do they round with, you know, critical care unit teams? You know, Rebecca, maybe I'll throw this, this over to you. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, that's one of the challenges of doing antibiotic stewardship when even when you have a well-resourced and kind of um, good people um, at the helm is just like, you know, over, you know, 50 to 60 percent of your hospitalized patients at any one moment are on antibiotics. So how do you choose who to review closely um, and go speak to, to the physician about. So we are constantly in the struggle of, I can't review everyone today. I'm going to have to prioritize who um, I really put my time in, um, especially when you're working with kind of a core group um, of, of uh, pharmacists and physicians. So, um, you know, our tools that we use to try and prioritize our reviews day to day haven't changed very much, but I will say that uh, the COVID patients um, rise to the top because of their complexity, their length of stay, um, and their antibiotic exposure. So we have uh, general tools that help us identify in our EHR uh, folks that have been on antibiotics for, you know, more than three days or have been um, on broad-spectrum antibiotics. Um, and so the COVID patients that have that are meeting those criteria kind of rise to the top. Um, so we've really used kind of our tools that we already um, had in place. Um, to, to also identify those opportunities for stewardship within our, our um, COVID population too. Um, and then in terms of dealing with kind of the, the disparities, you know, uh, heartbreaking disparities, truthfully, um, you know, our stewardship team has uh, done a lot in terms of educational materials. So uh, we mentioned all of our kind of in- investigational drugs you know, information from FDA, a lot of that comes with counseling materials. Um, And so getting, you know, Spanish language uh, fact sheets to the bedside, easy um, for access for the clinicians who are having these conversations with patients um, was one of the things that our stewardship team really worked on is having the materials that that folks need to to take care of patients who may not be, you know, native um, English speakers or, you know, maybe they uh, qualify for a research study um, and, you know, they have the option of enrolling. You need to get a translator there so that they can have every option available to them, um, be it through research or, you know, if they decide not to participate. Thank you. Thank you for those insights, particularly during this uh, this pandemic has really shown sort of the inequities in delivering health care. Um, I think, you know, we're approaching time, but I did want to, this is our last topic. What has the pandemic taught us about administrative pain points during surge capacity time? So we, we had sort of a thread running through here, which is, you know, stewardship teams are more than policing teams. I think if, if um, executives didn't believe that before, Certainly now it's on the radar. What do you foresee as pull-through teaching opportunities or or, or stewardship um, sort of roles post post pandemic for both stewardship teams and IPC teams since they're linked now by CMS? Yeah, maybe I'll, Calvin, it's a, yeah. it's a it's a I mean it's a great question. Is and this is something that we're you know, from a health system standpoint, we'll be reflecting on 
you know, for months, especially now as Utah is got case counts going down, hospitalizations going down, and we'll be reflecting back on, you know, what did we do well, not just from a stewardship and infectious disease standpoint, but from a health system standpoint. Um, and it's something that, you know, I think right now what we're going to be pulling through is the integration of stewardship across a healthcare network. And that is really a learning for us is to say um, Intermountain is 23 hospitals, but it's one stewardship team. And that stewardship team covers our entire facility. And having a stewardship program and an infection prevention program tied at the hip that is fully integrated across the entire system um, has been so critically valuable um, for us to be able to get these initiatives to the end of the road, to be able to make sure that a patient that shows up into our community access hospital in Delta, Utah, gets the same care, remdesivir, steroids, whether it be convalescent plasma, TOSI, whatever it might be, as somebody who shows up at Intermountain Medical Center, our big flagship hospital. And if they can't receive that care in, in Delta, Utah, they're being transferred to a place that they can. And having this system that's fully integrated across the entire system, using tele to our benefit, using this communication of stewards you know, from all of our facilities together through daily huddles to identify issues, to having these COVID rounds that uh, brings together an ID clinician with the stewardship pharmacist. You know, that has been the pull through for us is that we couldn't have done those unless we had a fully integrated, connected team across the network. Um, and that's, you know, certainly shown its value for us. Great. Thanks. And Rebecca, I'm going to give you last last word. Any any parting thoughts on on the topic? Yeah, I would I would just say that this pandemic is another opportunity for us to realize that um, the time to invest in infection prevention and antibiotic stewardship programs is not in the time of crisis. Um, it's in the time of crisis where you lean on these programs that you have built and supported uh, through time. I, I think I would feel sorry for someone trying to recruit um, an Eddie Senyam to lead their program right now because I doubt that uh, Utah would let <laughs> would let him leave. Um, so it's um, it's a it's something that you have to invest in in a time um, where you have time to think. Like once you get into the crisis time period, it's it, it's very hard to then you know rally your troops and put the resources into them. So it's something that uh, you know in the good times when we're not in a crisis, we have to maintain that res uh, that resource um, and that readiness. Um, even when you know we're not so focused on infection as um, as the forefront of our minds. Great, and, and th thank you for both of you for participating. And I want to thank the audience, and particularly AHA and Nancy Myers, for for getting us as many registrants as we did. As I mentioned earlier, this is the first session in a half-day event uh, titled "Infection Prevention and Pharmacy: The Road to Integrated Stewardship During a Pandemic." Uh, you can visit or uh, the link in the chat below to register for the remaining sessions. Uh, for those of you that are answering asking questions. Uh, Eddie and I have been answering them in the chat. We obviously ran out of time. Uh, we will collate, AHA will collate the remaining questions and we will get back to you. And uh, lastly, th there's a spring event in the BD virtual event series all together now uh, entitled Driving Patient-Centered Care Through Connectivity and that'll take place in May. Um, you can get more information at bd.com forward slash all together now for further information. Nancy, thank you so much again, and uh, thank you all, Eddie and Rebecca especially. Take care, everyone, and stay safe. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks, that Kelvin. Sorry, David. I was just going to remind <laughs> folks that we will be sending out to you the link so that you can view again or share this presentation with your colleagues. Um, it'll also include a link to the slide deck, which you can actually download today as well on your lower left-hand side of your screen. Thank you so much, and thanks for the work that each and every one of you are doing today and every day to take care of patients in our facilities. Uh, David, I'll hand it to you. 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes our presentation. You may disconnect your phone lines, log off your webinars, and thank you for joining us today.